And then she wrote one book, the name's escaping me. I'll include it down below. I have um, The Good Daughter, but I haven't read it yet. That's a lie. I have pretty girls. And I did Cloak and Dagger Christmas. I already said that. No, I didn't. Um, kind of in the late 90s. I don't think it was late 90s. Hi everyone, it's Audrey and welcome back to Chapter and Converse. Today's video is going to be part two of my December Rewind. And I posted a video mid-month um, just kind of giving a quick update of where I was at at that stage. And I talked about The Neighbors, Girl Wash Your Face, um, Three Blind Mice, Murder is Binding, and Tangerine. And I was doing Cloak and Dagger Christmas in December, which was eight books, was the goal. And I had some nonfiction that I was reading, so I figured I would split this into two parts so it doesn't turn into um, what's quickly becoming kind of marathon videos for me. But if you are interested in anything I have to say about those first five books, I will link the video down below so you can check that out. And for this video, we're just gonna talk about everything else that I read. When I was filming part one of my Rewind, I was reading All These Beautiful Strangers by Elizabeth Clay Foth, and I was probably like more than three quarters of the way through it at that point. And my mission for the day that I filmed the video was to basically do nothing else but finish the book. And that's exactly what I did. So I talked about this in my 2018 best of, and I also did a dedicated video for it. And I'll be honest, I don't know if it's going to be up before or after this. It's filmed and good to go, but I'm still kind of learning my way with when I post things and when I film things. So if it's not up already, stay tuned. And if it is up already, I'll link that down below and then you can click to that to hear kind of all the details on this. So I won't talk too much about it because it's kind of a waste of all of our times to be saying the same thing three times over. But basically this story is told from three different perspectives. So our chief character is Charlie Calloway and she's a 17 year old girl um, at this prestigious prep school in New Hampshire. And she's got two things going on in her life. She's trying to get initiated into the super exclusive um, kind of secret society at school called the A's, which is very much like the, the Skulls, that movie from however many years ago. And it's basically like you're set for life if you're in, and if you do what's asked of you, you're golden. And if you don't, you're not. So highly motivated to be a part of it, and she wants to be a part of it. So she's doing that. And the other storyline is 10 years prior, her mom disappeared one night and abandoned her and her younger sister and her dad. And nobody was ever found, no explanation was really given. And here in the current day, her mom's brother has discovered some new evidence that might explain what happened that night and help them solve where she is and what happened. And he comes to Charlie for help. So that's kind of the big setup. You are seeing present day you're seeing about 10 years earlier around the time when her mother disappears and then you're seeing about 10 or 12 years before that when her parents how they meet when they get married and a whole bunch about their marriage relationship and family and you're getting three different viewpoints so it's so good watch my other videos to hear more about it um, but could not recommend this book more so for Cloak and Dagger Christmas, there were eight prompts to follow and All These Beautiful Strangers was my something new because it was a brand new book for me. And then two more of the prompts are Sugar and Spice. So for Sugar, and I got this from the library, so I'll pop the picture up here. I read Poppy Done to Death by Charlene Harris and that is book number eight in the Aurora Tea Garden series. So I talked about this in my Cloak and Dagger TBR video and I'll I'll link that one down below too. So you can just <laughs> click your way through a whole bunch of my videos. Um, but seriously, the Aurora Tea Garden series is, this is the first book I've read in it, but they have all been made into Hallmark movies and mysteries movies. Um, and I've seen those. And as much as I love something dark, and you'll see that when I talk about my spice book, I also like a little levity and I like when things work out in the end, and I kind of like my Jessica Fletcher-ish type of mysteries too. It can't all be something shady and something really kind of gritty. So Aurora Tea Garden is just that, and the reason why I picked book number eight, and that probably seems kind of weird, but that movie was made, and I watched it, and it, like, it was fine, and when I was reading through 
the summaries of the books, the book description on this one was different than what happened in the movie. So I thought that would be a fun one to try. And it was completely different from the movie, which was great. So, I mean, basically like the same person dies, but everything around it and the, the why and the who done it and everything, and kind of literally like all the players in the book, other than her mom, are completely different in the series. So it is, it's a typical cozy. It was good. Like I wasn't blown away by it, but I enjoyed it. It was a quick read. It was fun to read the book after seeing the movie. So I, I have, you know, the actors in my head playing the people who were, who do show up in the book. I just, I enjoyed it. So I read it after my spice book. I probably should have talked about them in reverse order here. Um, but I needed the levity. I got exactly what I was looking for. And I'm actually going to start at the beginning with the Aurora Tea Garden books, just to read them, you know, kind of in line with the movies, which I've already seen, but I'm curious to see how everything develops and what else is different. And I was pleased to see there were so much differences. So it wasn't like I watched the movie first and then I read the book, which I've done. Um, and I'll talk about that at the end of this too. But it was just fun. If you're looking for something easy breezy, if you're looking for a cozy series to get into, highly recommend Aurora Tea Garden. Um, it was just, it was good. And it was, it was, it was exactly what I needed at that time. The spice book that I read is Perfect Remains by Helen Fields. And I was not familiar with Helen Fields until Thriller Fest this year. And she was on one of the panels, she was talking about her books, and they had it in the bookshop there, so I picked it up. And she's been likened to Karen Slaughter, and I'm obviously I know who she is and I'm familiar with her, but I haven't read any of her books. But I also picked up Pretty Girls at um, this same conference, which Karen Slaughter was at, but I haven't read it yet. And I've heard a lot of people say that her books are really tough to read and there's a lot of violence and violence against women and it can be kind of gritty and gruesome at times. So I was a little bit hesitant, you know, kind of going in. I wasn't sure what I was in for here. And I don't know what this says about me, but like there were definitely a couple scenes that were hard to read, but I was fine. So I have either been so jaded by, you know, the Linda Fair scene and the Patricia Cornwell and the kind of earlier days James Patterson and other um, kind of serial killer murderer horrible books that I've read that this was not horrifying to me and this was by far not one of the most difficult books I've read when it came to the violence part of it so if that means anything for people um, it's it's spice but it's not I've I've read worse when it comes to the violence but Anyway, um, this is the first in a four book series and this is where we meet Detective Inspector Luke Kalanack and he is kind of a disgraced Interpol agent who is basically forced to leave his position in France and he returns to Scotland which is where he was born but he left when he was like five years old and has been in France his entire adult or childhood and adult life. So not really familiar with the territory obviously new to the police squad, outsider trying to come in. It's a very tight knit group of people. So you are learning, you know, all the folks around him and he is handed this fairly gruesome murder on day one where a burnt body of a woman is found kind of two hours outside the city. And we're off to the races to figure out who she is, what happened to her, who could have done this and why. So he is digging deep into this. And the way that this book is done, you actually have a parallel storyline with the murderer. So you are seeing things through his eyes. You are understanding things about the victims. You're understanding the steps he takes. You're understanding, not that I understand why he does what he does, but you're seeing things from his, from his perspective too. So you have the information and you're kind of following the, the police investigation as well as what the killer is doing and you know another woman goes missing so it's not kind of a one and done and we're fighting to you know stop him before he takes more and takes and murders more women and there's also a secondary case that's going on with another person on the police force and they the cases don't tie together per se but they're they're happening in parallel and it'll all make sense when you're reading it but 
first impressions of her and her writing, I loved it. I, you know, I got, I hate to say I got through this, it makes it sound bad. I zipped through this rather quickly and I'm, I'm in, I'm definitely going to continue with the series. I really enjoyed it. I would say if you're looking, you know, for a new mystery writer, thriller writer, suspense, you know, kind of in the vein of what I understand Karen Slaughter is, um, I would look into Helen Fields. You can actually get all her books on Amazon now. Um, I think this summer, they might not have all been released here. You can also get them on Book Depository. I think the pricing is the same difference. And I think if you're a cover person like I am, I think the covers are the same. Um, but highly recommend. They're both, it's just, it's it's really good. It was a great introduction to her. And I was not at all um, disappointed going in kind of blind to a new writer. So I'm happy to have found a new author that I love. The next book I read for Cloak and Dagger Christmas was Agatha Christie and Then There Were None. And this was my travel book. And my <laughs> thought is these poor people travel to an island not knowing they're going to get picked off one by one. But there you go. Um, I really, I, I loved it. And I know people rave about this book as being, you know, her best and people's favorites. And I have to say, you know, I've read a bunch of her books and I really do enjoy this one. And I enjoy the twist and the mystery and the why are we all here. So if you don't know anything about this book, quick version, basically eight strangers are lured to this island. They all get an invitation, you know, to come to this island by someone that they all kind of think they know. And then they get there and they don't know anyone else who's there. And there's a man and a woman who's kind of like the butler and the cook and the house cleaner and all of that. And they take care of the house. So all in, there's 10 of them. And nobody quite knows why they're there and nobody quite knows who their host is. And they kind of start comparing notes and the host hasn't shown up yet. And the host is delayed in London. And um, all of a sudden one of them dies and then two of them die. And then the rest of them figure out, you know, one is bad two something shady is going on here. And there is no way onto the island because the boat who brought them there left. There's no way off the island because the boat who brought them there left. They are completely isolated, which means one of them is a murderer. So it becomes a group of people trying to find alliances and trying to obviously stay alive and figure out who is doing this to them. So if you have not read an Agatha Christie, by all means, start here. And if you haven't read this one yet, definitely pick it up. It's not a long book. It's 250 pages, I think. So it'll definitely be a quick read, but I think... I think it will be kind of universally enjoyable for people because it was just, it was just such a fun read. The next book I read was an audiobook, and it was Kat Marnell's How to Murder Your Life. And this is a memoir about her time in New York in kind of the magazine fashion industry. And she was a fashion editor. So she started as an intern, kind of worked her way up, became a fashion editor and worked at Lucky Magazine. And she worked at XOJane.com, which was Jane Pratt's eventual website, which is still in existence, but she had done Sassy and she had done Jane Magazine. And I thought this was going to, you know, be Devil Wears Prada. And I knew that Kat Marnell had an Adderall addiction. So it was sort of like her drug infused time in New York, but I thought it was going to be like Devil Wears Prada on speed. And it was, but it was also Devil Wears Prada on coke and heroin and more prescription pills than you can possibly imagine and more alcohol than you can possibly imagine. And I don't know, I feel like she did crack. I mean, it was just like, she did everything. And this was so much darker than I thought it was going to be. I had seen kind of some bad reviews on it, but I didn't really pay too much attention to them. And multiple times I was ready to DNF this book, but then it was like a car crash. Like I could not turn it off because I had to believe it was going to get better. And I had to believe she was going to get better. And I had to believe I was going to like her more by the end of it, thinking that's the whole point. She's sort of this horrible human being with this horrible addiction, but surely by the end, I will like her more. And I gotta say guys, like I liked her even less at the end. It was, this was a rough book. And this is not for the faint of heart. This is not for everyone between, I mean, the, the drug use and sex and language, um, keeping it clean here. But I mean, I am, I am not a naive person. I am, you know, none of it. But like, even at some points I was like, just, it felt like a lot of it was for shock value. And it was just, it was too much. Like it was overkill. 
but I listened to the whole thing and there's so many things I had trouble with with this book. She kind of, she starts from the beginning of her life and it's really when she gets to high school, she goes to a boarding school. I think it was like outside Boston. And that's really when her addiction started with the Adderall and her dad is writing her prescriptions. And kind of for most of this book, which is probably like the next 15 years of her life, her dad is one of the people who is providing her with the Adderall. And, you know, at the end of it, she's very much like, you know, form your own opinion, but don't blame my parents, but you're probably blaming my parents. And she paints them in a pretty terrible light. So it's hard not to, you know, kind of think about like, hey, maybe you should have stopped prescribing it for her. But she found all these other ways to get it in New York from all those doctors that exist, you know, in Manhattan that will just write prescriptions to anyone, no questions asked. She tells the story and she swears like it's the dialogue is all true. The stories are all true. Everything's totally accurate. But one of the things I had a hard time believing is how could you remember to such exquisite detail what was happening when you had been on like a 48 hour binge? So she said she kept journals. I don't know. I found a hard time believing that none of this one was sensationalized or embellished or kind of made up in any way. So there was that part, which was a little bit of a struggle for me. And I struggled with the fact that she clearly was doing this for years and years and at work and was high at work and, you know, wasn't sleeping and any of these things and was kind of screwing some stuff up, but she was totally committed because she was the only person who was never lacking for energy when she was completely on an Adderall rush. But no one intervened until sort of the very end where she got fired from a job. And she got fired because she literally sent her boss an email that was like, hey, sorry, I missed that photo shoot, but I did a bunch of heroin last night. <laughs> so like, hello, thank God that boss intervened and, you know, didn't kind of perpetuate and let her do this at work. But it was all just completely crazy. And she's like lives in squalor for part of it, but she's wearing, you know, Chanel and Marc Jacobs and all these fancy pants brands. But she's basically sleeping on a dirty floor in a dirty apartment in Manhattan with a roommate that she may or may not know, which I don't mean, I guess when all your money's going to drugs, that happens. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I struggled with is there is this theme of mice and rats. So if you're squeamish, right there with you. But it goes from like literally having mice and rats in her apartment to her being so out of her mind that she's hallucinating and seeing them. But there's this consistent gross referencing to mice and rats and ugh, ugh. I mean, it's just, it's gross. Like I, I was more skeeved by this than I was by Perfect Remain. I mean, if you had a curiosity about it like I did, get it for free from your library. Do not spend a penny on this thing. But she was in and out of rehab. She was at Bellevue at one point. Um, just, just a hot mess. And then you've got these publishers throwing tons of money at her to write a memoir because she was this socialite party girl hot on the scene and she wrote it and I read it. So there you have it. But that was not, not a good read or listen as the case may be. So the good news is I ended the month on a high note and I read All We Ever Wanted by Emily Giffen. And I was a huge Emily Giffen fan and I discovered her when Something Borrowed and Something Blue were both already out. And after that point, I was like, she was my no questions asked. I would buy her books the day they came out in hardcover. I'd go to the readings, I'd get online for the autograph. You know, I would read anything she wrote. I just loved her. And then a few years ago, she wrote this book. Um, I think it's like my one and only or the one and only. I hated this book with a passion. And I actually like, raged about it on Goodreads. So you can read my review there and I'm not going to talk about it here. I'll save that for another day. But basically at that stage, I figured that Emily and I were no longer besties and we needed to just take a bit of a break. So I did. So I didn't read her book after that. And then this book, All We Ever Wanted, just came out earlier this year. And I was curious about it, but at the same time, I was a little gun shy because you know, the book two books ago wasn't good. I mean, putting it lightly, I just, it di I did not get on with it basically is what it is. Somebody else might love it. It did not work for me, but I loved her writing and I was curious. So I got it from the library, which is why I'm not holding it. And I've already brought it back. And 
it reminded me why I love her books. So I literally just finished this the other day and I'm still processing it. So I almost wish I had read it earlier in the month, but I'm still kind of processing it. I feel like my, my opinions are changing a bit on certain things, but kind of let's just talk about the gist of it. So this book follows two families in Nashville and you have kind of this obscenely rich family and that's how she refers to herself. Nina is the protagonist there and it's her and her husband and their son Finch who's a senior at this prestigious school in Nashville and it's kind of all these rich privileged kids that live there. And then the second family is Tom and his daughter, daughter Lila. Daughter. Wow. <laughs> that's a bit of an accent, his daughter Lila. And he is a single father raising her, you know, he's a carpenter, he's kind of fighting to make ends meet. And she, I'm not sure if she's like a, in, as a scholarship or how she got into the school, but you know, he wants the best for her and kind of will do anything for her, but she does not have anything close to the money of these other kids. And she's the outsider. So when the book opens, you have sort of this, scandal that comes out so that all the the kids are all the high school kids are at a party at one of the other rich kids houses and it gets a bit out of hand and Finch takes a photo of Lila kind of passed out not fully clothed and sends it around to people and here comes the scandal of sort of the perfect boy and in this day and age and social media and all these horrible things that you hear about happening, it happens and it becomes how these families deal with it. You know, how could he possibly do this? He's never done anything wrong before. He's supposed to be this good, great golden child. He's just gotten into Princeton. His entire life is ahead of him. It's second semester, senior year. What are you doing? And then you have this girl who went to a party, drank too much, and now she is the victim of this horrendous, act and scandal and her photo is out everywhere and all the parents are sending it to each other and all the kids are sending it to each other and it's just the father wants to protect his daughter so what winds up happening and this is not in a spoiler sense but it it is brought to the attention of the headmaster at school and there are consequences for these types of actions as there should be and it becomes Nina, so you're reading it from Nina's perspective, you're reading it from Tom's perspective, which is the girl's father, and then you're reading it from Lila, the girl's perspective. And there were so many points throughout this book, and I think this is very intentional, where you're not really sure who's telling the truth, you're not sure who's lying, you're not really sure what happened that night, you're not sure of anybody. And you're not, I think you're not supposed to be, which is fine because that's the entire point of the book because what would be the fun if you were sure of everything. But I found myself going through times where I like, I, I wasn't liking what was happening, but then I liked it again. And there were things that I struggled with and there were things I struggled with with how the teenagers were being portrayed or what they were doing or things that the adults, um, particularly Nina was doing that just made me hate her at certain points. But then I loved her at certain points. And it's so much about, again, what I think is very prevalent and I could not be more grateful to not be a teenager in this day and age of social media and camera phones and videos and all of this other stuff. Um, just sort of how quickly things can turn, how one decision can affect everything, how everyone is vulnerable, how people might innocently do something that turns into something completely not innocent, how people might, you know, not be doing something with good intentions and trying to do something harmful to somebody else. And it's just, it's difficult to read at some points in the sense of, you know, these characters' decisions and their moral compass and the impact it has and the struggles of the family. And Nina is really struggling with the fact that this is her kid and I didn't raise someone to be this way and I didn't raise him like this. And it's her struggle of kind of like, how did I get here? How did this happen? How is this our reality? It takes a lot for a book to make me cry. And it's been a while since a book has made me cry. But there was one point in this book that I cried and it was like, yes, Emily, this is why I love your stuff. This is why I love your books. So she's got me back. It was such a good book. I'm still processing so much of it, 
but like I said, I was on a bit of a roller coaster at some point when I was reading it, where I was like, oh, I don't really like this, but then I did really like it, and I think you're kind of supposed to be on that roller coaster. So it's contemporary women's fiction. It's not a YA book, even though there's the elements of the two students, so they're like 17 and 18, but it's an adult book. Um, if you are curious about Emily Giffen, I would definitely read it. I going to talk a whole lot about her in a different um, video because I just still need to read her last book, but she's won me back over completely. So this was a great way to end the month. This was a great book to end on. And I really, I, I genuinely enjoyed it. I also wanted to quickly talk about two movies that I watched and I broke my own rule and I watched the movie before I read the book, but I have the books. So I'm gonna read them anyway, but I watched Crazy Rich Asians over Christmas and I can't even tell you why I didn't read the books. And I've had so many friends recommend them to me and I think just like any recommendations, it was like, I'll get to it, I'll get to it, and I didn't. Um, but I watched the movie, we, we did it on, um, like on demand where you can rent it for 48 hours and we watched it twice because that's how much I liked it. Um, it was such a fun movie. I just got the book from the library. I'd been on a wait list for a while and I literally picked up the book yesterday. So I'm starting to read it. Um, I'm excited to read it. I'm excited to kind of see the whole story because I know only a fraction of this 500 plus page book made it into the movie. But if you haven't seen the movie yet, totally see it. It was great. The music's great. The actors are great. And um, I'm excited for the book. So you'll hear about that more at the end of January. And because I couldn't get enough of Henry Golding in Crazy Rich Asians, I also watched A Simple Favor with him, and he plays the husband to Blake Lively, and then Anna Kendrick is the best friend. So Blake Lively's character goes missing. What happened? Where is she? La la la. Um, that's that story. So it was really good. The music was amazing in this one also. It is a, a dark humor, comedy, twisted mystery. Um, I don't want to give anything away. It was really, really good. I thought the movie was brilliant. And I also watched that one twice in my 48 hour period because I'm a woman obsessed. But I've heard that the book was not as good and people didn't really like the book. I'm gonna read it anyway because I'm just curious about it. Um, so I would say if you have read the book but not seen the movie, I would check out the movie because I think, I think it was really well done. And between like Anna Kendrick, who's just a riot, and Blake Lively does a really good job. Her clothes are beyond. There's this whole French music soundtrack to it, which is just ingenious. I just loved the entire thing. So that does it for December. That does it for 2018. We are done and dusted. I did seven out of eight books for Cloak and Dagger Christmas. My first readathon was a success. I saw some good movies. I discovered some new authors. I discovered audiobooks. I could not have ended the year on a better note. So I'm so excited about that. And I'm really excited for 2019. I would love to know um, if you guys have read any of these books or if you watched either of those movies and what you thought of them. And if you did books and movies, um, what you thought of one versus the other. But let me know down below. Check out some of those other videos I talked about. And I will be back soon, so hopefully you'll be back to join me. Thank you for hanging out a bit today, and I'll see you guys soon. Bye.